Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and here I am standing alongside my newly acquired South Bend milling machine, donated to my channel by Lost Creek Machinery. Thank you to those guys. And in this video today, the first of a number of videos that will be produced on this machine, it's just going to be a walk around to tell you some of the features of this machine as well as some of the issues that need to be corrected or solved or repaired before I fully use it. So let's begin. If you haven't watched this video yet you may want to and this is the delivery of the machine and the unloading of it taking place a couple weeks ago. These South Bend milling machines are kind of rare. I'm not sure how many were actually produced by South Bend. I have only seen four of them in my life. One was at the high school and this is the first one I ever saw and it came from Bloomington, Illinois. It was made in 1965 or 66 so it is very well used and I would say that it's possibly fairly worn out but yet a nice addition to my shop out here in the garage. I do not intend to put this in the basement alongside of my bridge port. This machine has a 42 inch long table. They were also available with a 32 inch. So I'm glad I got the long one but coupled with the power longitudinal feed here it really makes for a rather space consuming machine compared to that 32 inch table that I have downstairs on my bridge port. This machine is strictly three phase and there are three motors on this machine. This is the main drive motor for the spindle. It's a one horsepower GE 1725 220 volt of course and the unusual thing about this machine is, and let me move the camera. As I was saying, the thing that's different about this machine is that the motor is directly in line with or above the spindle. Therefore, there is no drawbar and the tool holder is a little bit different probably than what you have seen. I'll get to that in a minute. But because of the position of the motor, uh, they had to go a different route. I'm not sure why they did that. These machines were delivered in the 60s and 70s without belt guards. And this one was shop made as was the ones at school. Once the insurance man saw it, oh, but it was later. It was a decade later before the insurance company demanded a cover on this. Things were a lot different in the 60s. I don't think OSHA even existed yet, but this is an 8-speed machine. There's four steps here for the V-belt on the pulley, and then there is a timing pulley here that has two positions. For anyone interested, there's the catalog number. I'm not sure it's readable. And there is a chart for the positions of the belts and the slowest speed is I believe it says about 125 and the maximum is 3750 and it is equipped with Timken Berry. This is the spindle brake which I like very well but either the spring is shot or the brake lining is gone or I don't know what else could be wrong, but that needs to be fixed if, in fact, I want a break on the machine. This machine was shipped with all the bells and whistles. It has a power down feed, and this is hydraulic, and I'm going to talk much more about that. I've never used one, but it makes the machine rather big and clumsy because of the pump for that. The one that I had at school had strictly a hand feed for boring and that's really sufficient in most cases. And the machine was equipped with a power feed for the x-axis or longitudinal whatever you want to call it. It's strictly mechanical and that makes uh, for a rather clumsy looking gearbox here that's about a foot long. 
and that is coupled with this mechanism here for turning it on and off. Again, I've never used one of these. By the time I bought mine in 69 or 70 or whenever it was for the high school, they had dropped this. It probably cost too much to make, and you'll see why here in a minute. And it, mine came equipped simply with the modern version made by Synchro, I think is what it was, with a built-in motor and handle, so it was all self-contained, where, let me show you how complicated this thing is. Back on the side of the machine, there is what looks like a quick change gearbox, and that has a motor below it, looks like about a quarter horse motor, and it's connected by a drive shaft that then goes into, if we can see it here, a gearbox or a gear reducer, I'm not sure, and then the controls come around here to the front. Really complicated looking. And when I looked on the parts list, you wouldn't believe the number of parts involved in this accessory. Okay, I've moved the camera and you can see that we've got a little GE motor down here. And it has a separate switch right here for the on and off cutler hammer. And the whole thing is supported by a rather crude looking peg leg. Reminds me of a Logan lathe. On the top of the gearbox is an aluminum tool tray, which is kind of handy. I know it wouldn't take long for that to get loaded up with chips and tools. However, there is a significant crack in the casting, so that would be a good foundry project for me someday if I ever get around to it. Well, this machine came with quite a long cord. Uh, I would say that's probably 15 or 20 feet of heavy cord. It is three phase, but th all three motors combined isn't very much of a amperage draw. The big motor, I think, is only four amps. Anyway, looking at the gearbox from this side, you can see that there's a small pulley on the motor and a big one on the gearbox. And there is a belt guard for this made of aluminum. Not really sure why it's not on there. Maybe it was in the way when they moved it initially with a forklift and they didn't want to break it. Lay that off to the side. And now I'm going to zoom in a little closer on the gearbox. And then the output of the motor, as I just explained, with a drive shaft here, which is uh, telescopic. Couldn't think of a word goes into this gearbox mechanism and that's why I'm telling you that it really looks like it was expensive to make. There are so many parts. But looking back at the gearbox, initially when I saw this years ago I said, oh they just took one of the gearboxes off of an average South Bend lathe and put it on here, but really not so. This is totally specific for the purpose and there are two tumblers plus the gears that you see right here. All of these numbers here are in inches per minute of feed. And yes, there are 30 speeds all the way from, I've got to move in, 0.250 up to 15 inches per minute. And this is the first time that I laid my hands on these tumblers, but this one seems to actuate all right, but this one is not moving, so that will have to be addressed at some point. And on the back of the machine, a disconnect box and then a junction box here with one wire going over to the switch for the power feed. The other one going to the main drive motor and then yet a third one going into the hydraulic motor. 
The entire head of the machine is mounted on a round ram, as you see here, as some earlier bridge ports were. Probably not as good an idea as the dovetail that they are using on current uh, bridge ports and the clones, because I would think there was the possibility of this rotating on you just a little bit, but it can be moved in and out by loosening these two screws, and this crank is the same crank that is used to raise the knee and would be put in here and there's a rack I'm not sure if you can see it but it's a rack and pinion that would move the ram in and out now the south bend head can move from left to right if you're standing in front of the machine but you cannot knot it like you can with a bridge board and you know what I'm thankful for that that's a feature I never use and it's just a nuisance because you have to tram it in two different planes so I didn't like that at all but right here there's a little protractor and a zero mark and a vernier and this is uh, the same on the other side which kind of surprises me but there's a vernier there to help you set it accurately I do not remember much about that but I think you still got a problem of getting it right on zero the same as you would with a bridge port but this entire head can be rotated 360 degrees and while I'm under here in this position and this is the spindle lock not the spindle brake but the spindle lock and it's even marked here as such well I see several issues here I need a pin to put that tag back in place and there is a screw missing right here that allows you to engage or disengage this hand feed and convert it into a power feed however notice I'm gonna let go that the spring is broken that is supposed to hold the quill into uh, the upper position or into equilibrium and I know that won't be easy to fix and this of course is the spindle lock same as on the bridge port I think one of the big drawbacks of this machine is the type of spindle it does not have an R8 spindle which seems to have become the standard of the industry and there's an infinite number of uh, tools available to fit in that this uses a number 30 mm taper which is uh, stands for milling machine and that is the same taper that you see over here on my little clausing and the clausing looks so little in comparison but that is a number 30 only one collet came with this machine and this tool holder here is made by Universal that's the name of the company and it uses a double taper type of collet that's the three-quarter I'd like to get some more of these and since these were made in many sizes this being I think the smallest maybe not the smallest but it's called a ZZ compared to this larger universal that I use on the closing and you can see that they are not the same now originally there should have been a spanner that looked like this only in a smaller size that would fit that it was missing this one is off of the clausing however I had this in stock given to me by Cape Cod CNC a couple years ago and it just so happens that it fits now there are two of these I don't know why there was two but this one has an odd number of flutes on it uh, that is nine and it will not work with this however I have all kinds got somebody mowing out there actually raking leaves I got two different spanners here that will work so that's not really a problem and here's how you take this collet adapter out there are two dog pointed set screws I already had one loosened up 
and they go in there at an angle into these little pockets that you see here. Now notice that there is no tapped hole in here for a drawbar. However, this is what the arbor looks like for the closing. And you can see the taper is the same. However, it's been cut off right here. We don't need that because that's threaded for the drawbar. But there are no pockets in here. So there is a man on uh, YouTube that has one of these and he made a fixture so that he could with a carbide tool cut pockets in there. So that will probably be my source of tooling for this machine. This is the box of tooling that came from Lost Creek and some of the stuff is just oddballs that were thrown in here but I think here we got a couple stops for the longitudinal feed and there's some other cutters here. Now this is a mighty big cutter to put on a machine that size. And you can see that someone has made this by milling a notch in it. So that would work too. And they just put one, as big as this is, <laughs> there's just one notch that is only one screw would hold that. So it must have been sufficient. Here is, I don't even know what taper that is, but this would work. They also have put a notch in there. Almost looks like they used the grinder because this would be fairly hard. There's another one. I'm not sure what that's for. That's a part of something. And there's some spacers and T-bolts, but there's not a whole lot in there. And here is one of the indicator holders and it's missing the indicator and that is for the rod system which I'm going to talk about in a minute but while I'm here at the bench let me just say that I received this from a man Kurt uh, Dietrich in New York and he didn't know what it was till he saw my video and there it is with the federal indicator and so that will be usable on this machine so I thank you Kurt for that it's amazing to find one of those this is so heavy, it's all cast iron, but yet we know that an indicator is relatively delicate, so I guess that's why they made it that way, to protect it. The condition of the table is not particularly good, but remember this machine's about 55 years old and it's got the usual peck marks all over the place where a milling cutter ran into it or a hole was drilled into it in quite a few places here but it's probably typical of a machine of that age. Again, this is part of the feed. I have to try to figure that out myself. It's missing the knob here. And I can see that the set screws here on the collars, these are nice big satin chrome collars. I really like that. But these screws are probably missing the little brass insert in there. So all of those little issues have to be addressed at some point. And I said in other videos that this machine is unique in that the column here is a separate casting from the base and is bolted to the base with big bolts from the bottom side, which you cannot see. But this would just be the ideal candidate to take apart and put in the basement because you can break this machine down into smaller parts to get it down a set of stairs. And I had been looking for one of these for years and never could find one, and that's why I bought the bridge fort, which was no easy chore to get down the basement steps. And I just love that South Bend logo. There's also a South Bend logo cast into the column on the back side, but it was covered by that Bulldog electrical box. Now, what is this big clumsy box, you ask? Well, this is the hydraulic power feed for boring. And you talk about a lot of different parts on here. I looked through the parts manual and it's incredibly complex. I have never run one, so I will have to play around with it. I'm assuming that it works, but I really do not know that. If it did not work, does not work, I'm not even too upset about it. I probably would not try to repair it because it's very seldom that I need power feed for boring. 
And if I do, you know, turning this little crank is just about as good for the few projects that I do. I know that several of you that watched that previous video are wondering what is this outrageously large cabinet attached to it? Is it just for storage? And it goes all the way down almost to the ground. But what it is, is it contains the pump and the motor for that hydraulic downfeed of the quill that I just talked about. And the actual switch for it is right here, another Cutler hammer switch. Now I haven't had this cover off yet. And I'm going to do it right now. We'll take a look in there. I see that there's three screws for that and there's a bunch of screws that are obviously missing. So, and we got very nice uh, tool rest on top of that cabinet with a little rubber pad on it. So I will like that. I'm sure it'll become cluttered instantly. I'll take that cover off and be right back. Okay, there it is in all its glory. And you can see that that hydraulic pump takes up only a small portion of the space. Well, there it is. The motor and the pump. And then this is the tank right here for the hydraulic fluid. And there's a dipstick. And it appears to have plenty of fluid in there. Now, let me say something while I'm here. You've heard me scold people time after time. Do not use compressed air in the shop to clean the machines. Because look at the chips in there that have accumulated. And chips way up high. Now, gravity doesn't <laughs> bring chips in on top of the motor or up here. That's caused by a blast of 110 PSI compressed air. So that's why one of the reasons that I'm so dead set against compressed air, but it sure does a great job and it's so fast and easy. Well, what's all this space down here, you ask? Well, there was another option that this machine does not have, and that would be the coolant pump. And there's holes drilled in there for hoses, and there's one on the, on the side here for that. So that was the coolant pump and uh, a hole for the fluid to get back into the tank, and this machine was never equipped as such. And down here is a can. Actually, it's empty, but that's a South Bend can for the oil that would have been used. Oh, this is hydraulic oil. Yeah, and there's a part number on there and everything, but that's empty. And you know what? I'm thinking I wouldn't mind cutting part of the cover off. Just make it a half cover and this would be a good storage shelf down here because that's wasted space all these years. But again, it's outrageously large, this whole cabinet. I wonder what they were thinking. And remember, I do not have this machine wired up yet, so I'm unable to check the motors to see if they're okay. Real quickly, I'm going to put the camera underneath this uh, gearbox or whatever it is here that is used for the power feed just to show you how complicated the darn thing is. Well I'm not sure how well you can see that but you see that there's several other gears down underneath. Oh, we're looking up now. And then an extra long lead screw because of that. I lost my aim here, I know it. When this machine was built in 65 or 66, there was no such thing as a digital readout. It had not been developed or invented yet. So if great accuracy was needed on a machine, and this was sold to a tool and die shop, they used a system of indicators and rods in a trough to measure accurately the movement of the table in both the X and the Y axes and on this machine that was of course a option but it's very similar to what they used on jig borers so in a way this machine became a jig borer 
probably even more accurate than a digital readout, although that is debatable, I suppose. But Moore was the major manufacturer of jig bores, and they used the system of rods and trays and indicators. I have never actually used it, although I've seen demonstrations on it. Now, part of this is missing. So there should be a trough or a tray that was bolted onto the front of the machine that was probably taken off. They didn't use it or damaged or whatever. So I can't talk about that. But this is the trough or tray. I'm going to call it a trough. It's kind of like a little V type of uh, cast iron, very sturdy, and it's bolted on to the knee for the Y axis. And of course, I showed you already that that indicator is long gone, but I will probably mount this one on there. And then in order to use this, and I have to study up a little bit on, my, on myself <clears throat> in order to uh, learn how to use that, but rods are put in there. Now, when I went over to Lost Creek Machinery, Matt said, well, you know, these have been sitting on the shelf for years. Take these. And he gave me two sets of these. These are Lufkin brand. And they consist, there's a lot of uses for these. And each tray here came with a micrometer, a Lufkin double-ended type of micrometer. And these are very accurately made rods. This looks like it's, what, the three or the four inch. And has a little anvil on there and those are laid in the tray like that however many of them are needed and then in conjunction with the indicator you can move the table very accurately now I can't demonstrate that now I I'm just kind of blowing smoke to tell you the general idea of what this system was and it is shown in the old South Bend catalogs I should show a picture of that, but maybe I will not. But, but that is interesting. Now, some milling machines, such as the Index brand, that was a brand of milling machine, and I think it became Wells Index. And when I worked on one of those, my brother was working on this at K&K, and, and I was over at Osborne using Index mills. There were two of them. And by the way, they used a Morse taper spindle. But on the front of those machines and on the knee, was vernier scales so you could do extremely accurate work as well with vernier scales but again that's very subject to error and operator uh, talent and, uh, and experience in order to use verniers if you don't use them every day it's pretty easy to make a mistake a lot of machinists don't even know how to use a vernier anymore thank goodness Applied a special wrench with a hex on the end of it that could be used to move the lock the ram I showed you that before or to loosen these four Socket head set screws which would allow you then to tilt the head to the left or the right and Looking in the parts catalog. I realized that they made that in two styles because there's really very little access to these bolts that are hidden behind this monstrosity of a hydraulic uh, down feed. So I'll have to see if I can make one of those or modify socket wrenches, you know, with a with a hex key on the end. But there was a specific tool for that probably lost 40 years ago. Well, that concludes this walk around video of the new South Bend milling machine. Hope you enjoyed it. It wasn't really meant to demonstrate uh, the use of the machine, but just the different features and the different things on this machine that I will have to correct or repair before I get a chance to actually use it. But winter is drawing nigh and it'll be uh, 10 below in here before long. And I'm not going to do anything with this machine other than maybe clean it up a little bit and then re-oil it for the winter. And I would like to at least get it wired and maybe check the motors to see the condition of those. But other than that, that concludes this session. Hope you enjoyed it. Keep your eye open for one of these machines. Put it in the comments if you have ever even seen one. I really wonder how many were made, but I'm thinking maybe it was only a few thousand.
throughout the whole country. Maybe some of them were exported. I really don't know. But remember, when I bought mine in 1969 for the high school, bridge ports were not available. That is, there was a two-year waiting list for them. So people went another way by buying one of these or I don't know what else, but at that time, I don't believe all these Chinese imports were available yet. So, Mr. Pete saying so long for now. By contrast with the Bridgeport Mill here, you can see that the entire feeding mechanism for the quill is quite compact, all incorporated into the head. No hydraulics needed. Now when we compare the bridge port head with the south bend, you can see that the motor is placed somewhat behind the center line of the spindle, this being the drawbar for the bridge port, which allows us to have a hollow spindle so that tooling and collets and whatnot can fit farther up into the quill with this wonderful R8 spindle and this whole problem here with the south bend having the motor directly over head preventing a drawbar might have been the death blow to the south bend milling machine. This is a reprint of the original 1956 introductory brochure for the machine. It has a much cleaner look without all of the accessories on it. And notice the one-piece base and it's listed at $1,675.